6 on ABC TV and streaming on iview. Should Sydney lock down to protect the nation? Also tonight, we'll turn our minds to life on the spectrum. And Barnaby 2.0, the Deputy PM, returns. Welcome to Q&A. Hey there and welcome to the program. It's great to be back. Joining me on the panel tonight, CEO of Autism Awareness Australia, Nicole Rogerson. Public health strategist, Bill Botel. In Brisbane tonight, one of the crowd favourites from Love on the Spectrum. We're delighted to welcome Jaden Evans. Also from Canberra, Labor's Andrew Lee. And with us, epidemiologist Mary Louise McClaws. And due to join us shortly is Liberal Senator Holly Hughes, who, as it turns out, has gone into isolation tonight herself and is awaiting COVID test results. So she'll join us during the program when she can. Please make all of them feel welcome. And I should also let you know that due to COVID, uh, Paralympic athlete Madison de Rosario won't be with us tonight. We're going to look forward to having her on the show again soon. You can stream us live on iview and all the socials. As always, Quanda is the hashtag. Please do keep it respectful. Our first question tonight comes from Noah Smith. There have been more cases or similar amount of cases in Sydney than there was in the Northern Beaches in December when they went into lockdown. So why hasn't Sydney gone into lockdown? Mary Louise McClaws, I know you were going to be in the studio with us tonight. You've decided not to explain why. It's to do with this question, isn't it? It is. Uh, given that I've been saying since last week that we should have gone into a short, sharp lockdown to keep everybody from moving around, particularly those that don't know they're infected, I decided that I need to, uh, to practice what I preach as an outbreak manager. Has New South Wales got it wrong? I think New South Wales is loath to use lockdowns. Mostly every other state does. Um, outbreak managers who've had practical experience understand the adage of going early, going hard with very um, inadequate or imperfect data. And then when there isn't any outbreak, uh, they get criticised, um, but often they do the right thing. So I think that this time they've had a very slow increase in numbers and then a very high um, uh, peak, which is quite unusual for this uh, variant of concern. But I still think that they should have gone into a sharp lockdown to stop people from particularly wandering over the weekend. To Noah's question, though, when the Northern Beaches went into lockdown, there was 38 cases, I think, linked to that cluster. There's 36 cases linked to the Bondi cluster, 49 locally acquired infections so far in this latest Sydney outbreak. Can you help us understand why a decision, a different decision is being taken here? Well, I think that with the Northern Beach outbreak, and they had 41 to it, in total, and it took them over a month to get to um, zero, <coughs> sorry, zeros. I think that they uh, went into lockdown fast um, because of the large numbers at the beginning. And so that they were very concerned it would be out of control. And quite rightly, they went into lockdown. It was sensible. Uh, and, and they were identified as being very sensible. With this one, because it went slowly, and because they probably missed the boat in stopping people from um, wandering on the weekends, uh, going to New Zealand, going to uh, to, to Melbourne, uh, going to a party, etc., cetera, uh, it, they probably feel they don't want to now or they feel they've got it under control. But I'm concerned that that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, do, do you really think they have it under control in New South Wales? Um, well, no. I mean, we've had several cases that uh, are potentially causing more harm down in Melbourne. Uh, we have the hairdresser that has uh, been a missed uh, or mystery link, as they call it. Uh, then we've had the woman that went to New Zealand. So we're going to see more cases. They may not be enormous in number, but that's beside the point. This is a variant of concern that has a reputation for causing more hospitalisation and, of course, for children because of the large numbers of people they can infect. All right, let's take our next question. It comes from Eric Coleman. Uh, just leading on from the last question, I think it sort of um, 
leads on quite well, is the current handling of the New South Wales COVID cluster by testing and contact tracing, coupled with proportionate measures such as mask wearing, something that the other states can learn from rather than plunging entire cities into lockdown at the first sign of a positive COVID community case, as we've seen in Brisbane and Perth. Bill Botel. Well, uh, we're here now, uh, 18 months into the pandemic, and we are repeating. We're back to where we were, it seems, February, March last year. And by now, 18 months into this, what we should be thinking about is how we could prudently open up uh, our borders internally and internationally, and we're not. And the reason we're not is because there's been a very serious failure of quarantine arrangements, particularly in this case at Sydney Airport, and a very poor vaccination rate. So we don't have the options that we would have if in Australia today, 57% uh, of people had had uh, double vaccinations. Only about 5% have. So we've brought this on ourselves by the decisions that have been taken that have not really kept up with the emergence of the COVID Delta variant, which is much more infectious. This was not the case with the Northern Beaches episode in Sydney or the crossroads. Uh, it is much more infectious. And the Premier's right to say this is a very scary moment. But you can't have it both ways. You can't say it's a scary moment and we must do all of the things that we must do, testing and so on, and then think, well, it's business as usual. We can, we can be comfortable and this word proportionate in our response. We only have one weapon in our armoury, unfortunately, now that works and that's as mary louise said a short sharp lockdown mary louise then if the argument is that what new south wales has done in the past has worked does it still work with the delta strain well that's a very big experiment and not one that i'd be willing to play with with people's lives right. and uh, you know bill has mentioned that this is highly infectious let me remind you that the alpha strain was 33% more infectious than the wild strain, than the Wuhan. This one is double that. So in effect, it's about 90% more infectious than the Wuhan strain. And of course, uh, we're seeing more people going to hospital. Uh, so it's an experiment that I don't think I would be willing to play with. And. Um, and yes, Bill is quite right. You know, the quarantine system is letting us down. We've had 21,000 cases since we uh, developed this mandatory quarantine system uh, because of the 27 breaches that we've had. We need to shore that up and we need to roll out the vaccine as soon as possible, but not to um, the Pfizer, but not to those that are anyone under 60 to 40, but to the group that are going to be more at risk of acquiring it and spreading it, and that's the 20 to 39 year olds. They have to be our priority. And Mary Louise, the Prime Minister today dismissed that view and said that the, the design of this rollout is based on the medical advice. You're now at odds with the Prime Minister on this. Well, I am. Uh, so last year, WHO provided me with the COVAX facility framework, and I went back to them and said, this is a very compassionate framework. They said, absolutely, because you're only going to get 3%, then 17%, so it has to be for frontline workers and the vulnerable. Quite right. However, that was for a circulating virus, a high level of circulating virus. And I went back to them and said, but we are different. And they said, well, as a member country, you can do whatever you like. And so epidemiologists would then say, you go where you get most juice for your squeeze. And that is the 40% of cases in the 20 to 39 year old. They are the biggest group. The next group, of course, is the 40 to 60, and that's only 24%. Now, sure, they don't have the same risk risk of death as those 70 and over. But if the young ones don't get it, they can't spread it. So we really need to protect the young right now. Jaden, I want to bring you in here. You are in Queensland right now. You're joining us from Brisbane tonight because of these COVID border restrictions. You live in a state where there has been some short, sharp lockdowns and a, it seems a greater eagerness to lock borders down. Does it make sense to you why New South Wales isn't doing that right now, and Sydney particularly? Uh, no, no, but I think that is a consequence of my own uh, unawareness of the situation down there in contrast to perhaps my state of being more informed about the situation here in Queensland. In Gympie more specifically, we have been 
very distant, I suppose, from the physical consequences of, of the status of lockdowns that have occurred. It has only really been, well, there was the start of the, pa the pandemic with the national lockdown, and then later there was a two-week lockdown, not quite a lockdown in Gympie, but a two-week period where we were mandated to wear masks. So that is all the contact we truthfully have had with the coronavirus. So we are quite, quite distant from it. So having been in that environment, I, I possess no awareness of, of the situation that is occurring in New South Wales. Nicole, you're in Sydney. Does it make sense to you? Well, listen, you know what? I'm not going to be like everybody else on Twitter who's not an epidemiologist who gives their opinion on COVID because we've got two incredible brains here who can do that. I would just say that some of the things to factor in, of course, we all have to behave and be grown-ups and get our vaccinations as soon as we possibly can. Um, all of those things that we need to do, exactly what the advice is telling us. But it's, it's worthwhile just keeping in mind that when we talk about the vaccine rollout, um, yes, it has been poor across the board, but it's almost been non-existent for those with the disability. So um, that's a really shameful situation that we're in at the moment. People with a disability were recognised to be in phase 1B uh, and the vast majority of those, particularly those living in group housing, have not been vaccinated. So um, we're letting a lot of people down here. All right, let's take our next question. Before we do, we're going to say goodbye to Mary Louise McClaws. Thank you for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Uh, and our next question is a video from Nicholas Painter Bosworth in Bondi Junction, New South Wales. We were told that we were front of the queue, the envy of the world, and the best in class when it comes to COVID response. We've done so well with COVID so far, so why is it now that we only have 3% of our population fully vaccinated and our cities are constantly suffering from small outbreaks? Is it about time that we admit that our world-famous Aussie optimism is now looking a little bit more like Aussie arrogance as we've failed to plan for an extra strategy out of this and friend being left behind? Andrew Lee. Nicholas, you're absolutely right. So, and the fact is that these lockdowns are having a, a terrible effect on people. I can only imagine what it's like for Sydney siders now cancelling weddings, uh, I think cancelling 21st birthdays, not being able to see loved ones. But we've seen a succession of these lockdowns and we will continue to see more while 97% of Australians aren't fully vaccinated. I was looking across OECD numbers. We are dead last in the rich country OECD, OECD group. I look back to what the Prime Minister was saying in January about the rollout timetable. That would have had more than half of Australians fully vaccinated by now. Uh, and that's the situation in the United States. The reason you're not seeing lockdowns in places like New York and Los Angeles is because in those places they had the multiple vaccine deals in place, uh, which ensured that they weren't strongly reliant on a single vaccine. In Australia, the penny pinching of the Morrison government in the middle of last year meant that we didn't sign up to five or six vaccine deals. And then when problems developed with AstraZeneca and the supply of Pfizer, uh, we were then put in a situation where we weren't able to vaccinate the population. Uh, quarantine is a federal responsibility, right there in the Constitution. Vaccination is a federal responsibility. And so the premiers are now having to clean up the mess of Scott Morrison. Uh, and uh, Australians are, are suffering, uh, costing the economy billions, but of course the social cost is the real pain. The fact that we won't be reopening the borders uh, until sometime next year. Uh, the government uh, has now shifted from talking about targets and timetables to talking about horizons, which is a bit strange because by definition, you don't ever get to the horizon. All right, I want to bring in Senator Holly Hughes, who is joining us from Canberra tonight. Holly, uh, I think you are isolating, self-isolating tonight, awaiting uh, COVID uh, uh, test or um, results to come through at the very least. Is this in part due to the fact that the federal government is actually failing on the rollout? No, absolutely not. And if you look at what's happening in Sydney, Gladys has consistently demonstrated the gold standard of COVID management. She has absolutely acted with logic rather than panic at every opportunity. And I think we're certainly seeing that that's the way she's approaching this again. Gladys and her government has a very good understanding that we need to keep the economy open. 
we need to keep people's lives as, as solid as we can. If we look at the mental health issues that are now impacting some of Victorians over these rolling lockdowns, but the businesses that are being forced to close and the long-term economic impacts, uh, Gladys is taking a really sensible approach to it. But I will let you know, Hamish, I've already got my negative test results, so I could have actually been there with you. <laughs> well, we're very happy to hear that result. But Gladys Berejiklian is pointing out that actually this would be different if there was more access to vaccines. That is your government's responsibility, isn't it? The vaccine rollout is happening you know, in, in line with all the health advice that was given. And if we look at vaccine rollouts that have occurred across the world, they've occurred uh, quite slowly at the beginning and then exponentially increased. And we saw yesterday 140,000 Australians received a vaccine. We've seen uh, in, the, in the last couple of weeks the time frame between each million people, a number of people that are receiving a dose of vaccine, uh, it, you know, go to nine days between each million. So uh, by today, we should have actually hit seven million people. But there is an awful lot of misinformation being given. So we hear things about 3% of the population. Well, that's just rubbish because, I mean, acknowledging what uh, Mary Louise, I think, said earlier, we're not doing under 16s and we're only doing 50 to 70s in some states and only some... But, but hang on, sorry, just, on, just on misinformation, I mean, the Prime Minister has been asked to clarify mm. exactly what proportion of the population has had both doses of the vaccine mm. and won't give it. All we're being, well, being given is... is the total number of vaccines that have been administered. Uh, isn't the government actually in part responsible for that confusion? Yeah, no, the, see, this is part of the misinformation, Hamish, and it's really important that Australians get clear and correct factual information. Both Professor Murphy and Professor Kelly have been very, very clear, and quite frankly, I'd prefer to take their advice. They have been very clear that one dose of the vaccine will provide 80% protection. Yes, we want everyone to get their second dose. There's a three-month lag between the first dose and the second dose of AZ. So, of course, there's going to be a lag for that second dose. But we but, are encouraging so can, can you to get tell us how, Can you tell us what proportion of the population's had both doses? I, I don't know, because you know why? We don't have mandatory reporting either. We don't have people's health records out and available. We do have on everyone's MyGov what vaccines you've had, but uh, as I haven't actually checked mine since oh. I had my first Pfizer a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if that's there. Bill but Botel. we don't have... Oh. The, the recording, and quite frankly, I, I actually would love to see the recording. I'm supposed to go to Queensland on Sunday and can't go, and I'll have had my second Pfizer shot. It is absolutely insanity, these lockdowns, killing business, killing tourism, affecting the economy long term, with knee-jerk reactions with people that have received the vaccine. Well, Hamish, we can tell you those numbers for the United States, 56%, Britain, 60%. And I went on to their health, health websites to get those numbers. And the fact yeah, that the government look isn't at the death producing rate this. in New York and LA to hold them up as the bastions and examples of what a our, great our premiers have done astonishingly just, well. So, will we really yeah, will we really keep so our borders closed until the end of next fairing. year? The notion that the, the notion that Australia can't roll out a vaccine faster than any other oh, country in Andrew, the advanced stop world should be a natural people. embarrassment. Absolutely ridiculous. It's, stop it is the, the fear. Holly, the fear that people are experiencing is a fear of the fact that uh, they are not vaccinated. That stands in well, stark contrast with many other advanced countries. If countries. you're in New South Wales, and it's 40 a direct to 49, you can register for of the for failure to sign up to multiple va vaccine, vaccine agreements. AstraZeneca the has a free absolutely gap. ridiculous Pfizer notion that there isn't a supply gap. of vaccines. So if we'd signed up to dose. more Holly Pfizer, and Andrew, then we would be able, would be able to, uh, to vaccinate uh, more quickly. Holly and Andrew, I'm this just going to ask Bill Bertil to... To no, respond to this, Holly, that Holly, the Labor can, Party's been can we all get day. a word in here? There is an Australian immunisation register that has all the details of the vaccinations that you seek. It's there, facts and figures. Okay, I haven't Fewer, checked mine, but well, I know the others. No, it, it's accumulated by the Australian government. The facts and figures are known. Now, uh, look, fewer than five percent of Australians tonight are fully vaccinated. In Israel, it's fifty-seven percent. Right? A year ago, the Australian government declined to follow the lead of the United Kingdom government and back every horse in the race so that we might have had an adequate supply of, of, of vaccines in Australia from whatever source by the beginning of this year and we would have got on with a rapid and urgent vaccination program. And by today, the 30th of June, 
the overwhelming majority of Australians would be vaccinated. But, but Tonight in New South Wales, there, there, there are 40 people, there are 40 people who have got a diagnosis 16, of COVID 000. who should not have had it. Bill, just on that, 16, though... 16,000 people in the UK were diagnosed with COVID. 16,000. 19 people yesterday lost their life in the UK. We had 11 cases in New South Wales. That's right. 10 of which were closely associated contacts living with already in isolation with previous positive cases. Okay. This is scaremongering. And to claim oh, that the UK right. somehow, somehow the UK's vaccination rate is having this great impact when 19 people lost their life yesterday, 16,000 people were had positive test results. Uh, can you imagine what Dan Andrews would do if 16,000 people in Victoria had a positive test? No one would ever get there again. I, I think right there and then maybe could I interject just to say possibly taking the politics out of this might be wise. I, you know, with great respect to Holly and Andrew, I don't think Australians care whether the team A or team B are giving us the advice. I think we'd like health advice um, from brainy people who know what they're talking about. Man, we lost Team Australia really quickly. You know, we all of a sudden became, you know, my Premier is better than your Premier. And mm. I, I yeah. think all of them have been working 24 hours a day and doing the, the best job they possibly can to keep us all safe. I, I think Australia wants to hear about what we do collectively rather than us beating the Melburnians sure. or, or you guys having a fight on TV, which is kind of fun to watch. But ultimately, people well, at home and, and the, feel depressed. The history of HIV and now of COVID is nature creates the viruses, but lousy politicians create and prolong pandemics. Now, mm. that's the, well, that's the lesson the of the United the States and the United Kingdom. The and here we are. Well, the chief, the, the advice given to the Australian government a year ago mm. was let it in, let it run. The economy was more important than public health. Uh, that was wrong advice. I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're... OK, well, I'm preparing okay. to take the advice of the Chief Medical Officer and Which also is Dr well, Brenda well, Murphy. Holly, by, how, by when will all Australians be vaccinated? This year? Well, it's not year. a compulsory vaccine for a start, so it's a voluntary program. So let's look at the fact that 66%, over 66% of over 70s have now received a dose of the vaccine. And we do know that makes them 80% protected, even if they've only had the first dose. No, it doesn't. We have close to, if not more than 50%. Well, I'm sorry, Bill, that might be your opinion, but it's not the opinion okay. of the Chief Medical oh. Officer or Brendan Murphy. I and think... I would prefer to take their advice. On that note, we're going to turn to a very different topic. You're watching Q&A live and sometimes unpredictable. Uh, now something entirely different. Our next question is a video from Oliver Hetherington Page in Highgate Hill, Queensland. As a person on this spectrum, I feel my autism is constantly measured against autistic characters in popular culture like Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory and the lead doctor in The Good Doctor, both of which are not starring autistic actors or written by autistic people. My question to the panel is how important is actually autistic voices in telling autistic stories uh, plays a role in authentic autism representation? Jaden. All right. So this is, this is curious. It is very, very important because I think on characters such as Sheldon Cooper and the character from The Good Doctor. I have not watched The Good Doctor, so I, I do not know the name of the character, but they... Oh, in, in, in many ways, they embody different different archetypes of, of what has been presumed of autism, and that in itself can be entertaining in the instance of Sheldon Cooper, and in the instance of the character from The Good Doctor, I believe he is portrayed as a savant, which... I suppose there's also some veracity in that as well, but the individuals I work with, they are not, they're not quite savants. They're not Sheldon Cooper, who is a physicist, nor uh, a doctor who has all this access to resources and, and energy and, and I suppose the brilliance that being a doctor incurs as well. The people I work with are quite disadvantaged in their situations. They, they may not be aware of their diagnosis. They may not have access to any, to, to the same resources of my, as myself, and perhaps more. More, I suppose, I would say individuals who are privileged to have perhaps both a mother and a father who are willing to support them, 
in that growth who are willing to make them aware of that diagnosis and to accumulate the supports that are necessary. That's not always so with the people I work with. They, especially in Gympie, where I think in general there is, I suppose, an issue perhaps in in the economic well-being of certain demographics in the community. And probably opportunities, Jaden, too. I'd say, you know, it's a really good question. And if there were more opportunities for, for young people, uh, or any age person on the autism spectrum, to be able to play a role um, in more mainstream shows, of course, that would be incredibly welcome. Mm. It's a tricky one, right, though, because mm. actors act, right? I, I was fairly sure that Matt Damon wasn't an astronaut in that film. Um, so, like, you know, it, it's fair <laughs> that you're allowed to come on and be something else. But, but I think... But, 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 but to that point, though, the nation's fallen in love with Jaden and a whole cast uh -oh. of characters from, <laughs> from Love on the Spectrum. I want to ask him about that, <laughs> but I also want to ask you, because you were approached about it in the beginning and you hated the idea. Why? Jaden, just block your ears for a minute, okay? Uh, yeah, so the, the producers of Love on the Spectrum came to me to ask me what the opinion was to make the show, and the genius level that I, I have in my television skills, I, um, I told them it was the worst idea. I might have even slightly threatened them, actually. I said it was just terrible and they weren't to do it. But to be fair... You thought it was going to be like The Bachelor. Well, your reality romantic shows aren't necessarily the classiest of shows. Um, so I was the most wrong person on that, and Jaden and um, all of his colleagues that have been on the show over two seasons have done an excellent job and Australia absolutely fell in love with them and I know nothing. Uh, Jaden, what has the reaction been for you? What's the experience been like having people from all walks of life know you, know your story and, and feel inclined to, to reach out to you and, and, and try and know you more? Oh, uh, well, humbling a little bit. I, I've always approached with responses that I've tried to ensure were as modest as possible. Uh, it, it mostly has been through social media thus far. In Gympie, there's only been one person who has noticed me. I have grown a beard <laughs> since my appearance in the documentary series, so I think that has impaired the ability of strangers to recognise me. But otherwise, in the streets, I have not ostensibly being recognised. On social media there has been some engagement with people who were quite fond of of the role of representation that I assumed in the series and and also I suppose my open exploration as well of certain aspects of my identity. So people were very fond to have been able to witness that. Uh, Jaden, you mentioned earlier that the love life experienced a lot of interest from people on social media. <laughs> Yes, yes, and it, it has been a little flirtatious, but I have been able to cope well with that. It simply is to <laughs> respond with as much, uh, as much sincerity as I can to that and sometimes play around with it a little as well. It, it seems to be a bit fun <laughs> to play around with it. <laughs> OK, Go don't break it. too many hearts. Uh, Dwayne, oh, Fernandez, no, no. Dwayne <laughs> Fernandez is in the audience. I know you're a fan of the show. What, what, what did you connect with so much? Oh. I absolutely love the show. I've been watching it for the last two seasons. I've um, been following the journey of Michael and, and, and the entire crew. But, um, Jane, for you specifically, I did want to know, um, how do you find being part of the show and sharing so much of yourself? How have I found that? Yeah. Liberating, in a sense, because it, it, was, it was discussed in, in the series, in the interviews that were done with me, that... My diagnosis was not something I was always willing to acknowledge and the repercussions of that socially and emotionally were not very ideal. So I put myself to the effort of, of, of studying it a little more because I've always been adverse to, to labels. I think many people on the spectrum are and that is why, well their parents as well and that is why they may be adverse to the recognition of that diagnosis. For myself, Diagnosis is the Greek word that means to know, to know uh, the thing by which one can know through. Or, no, I have put that very wrongly because it is tricky to put Greek terms into English terms. But a diagnosis, through a diagnosis, you can see something, you can know something, you can understand something. So for me, it was a point of reference where I can read about the patternicity of my mind, because even though I firmly believe that my mind and brain is very indi individualistic, I also know that 
it is a human brain as well and therefore abides by the same the same patterns and neurological habits that everyone else abides by so that has allowed me to find some identity with it but also awareness that the responsibility of having that identity is to know that it's not quite by this dichotomy where I am a neurodiverse person and everyone is a neurotypical person because that can be a bit precarious where you begin to to perceive yourself as different or as a a different tribal group from everyone else and that was precarious for me so so that was the responsibility I took on for myself to be aware of of that of that possibility and to be as firm as I can in also associating myself with everyone else as much as possible whilst acknowledging this part of my idiosyncrasy so that the series has offered me a lot in in my perception of that Holly Hughes, I, I can see you smiling away at Jaden's response. Oh, it's just lovely. I mean, I adore the program. I think everyone's just, you know, it's it's so beautiful for people that don't have uh, first-hand experience with autism to get to see the personalities of, you know, and I think Nicole would agree with me here, we, we tend to use the phrase, our kids. Um, because we do uh, see ourselves as part of a, a community. And, uh, and, and Jaden, Michael, all the boys and girls just do a beautiful job uh, you know, throughout the series. Um, but the beautiful thing, I think, about not only Love on the Spectrum, but also some of the other shows that uh, showcase autism, and, and one of the ones we didn't mention was Everything's Gonna Be Okay, and that mm. actually does have autistic actors yes. in it, and the character yes. of Drea is just wonderful. But it is important that uh, there's a saying in the autism community, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Everyone is very, very different. And we need to make sure that the whole spectrum is recognised and we don't fall into a trap somewhere that they're, they're being stereotyped into the physicist, uh, you know, the uh, physicist or the savant, because mm. we do have people with autism, with very severe autism, with non-verbal autism, with very, very significant challenges. Holly, I suspect most viewers won't know your story or your son's story, but what can a, an experience or, or viewing something like this, seeing it on a public stage, do for a young person living on the spectrum? I think well, my son's at 12, so he's he's probably still not quite grasping it. Um, but we've always talked about autism and him being autistic the same way, you know, as someone has blue eyes or they're funny or, you know, whatever it might be. It's just part of who he is. Uh, it's never been something that we as a family have ever felt that we didn't uh, need or want to talk about and acknowledge. And I think that's not the same for all families. So I think normalising it, if that's, you know, no doubt the wrong word, but uh, showing that people with autism have so much to offer, that they are full of love and affection and they are funny and wonderful and some of our favourite human beings on the world, uh, in the world. I mean, they are just uh, never cease to amaze you and bring so much joy to your life. And the more people that get to see that, the more people that get to experience that and the more people that get to see their minds opened up. Because if you don't have any personal experience, you might not really know what autism is all about. And so this can, can really help break down any stigmas, give families the confidence to, to go out if they do have a child with autism and for autistic individuals to, to own that autism and be proud of it. Okay. And I think, I think no. too, what Holly's referring to is the fact that, you know, there is no one autism. You know, there's autisms. It's a very broad spectrum. I think Love on the Spectrum did a, a good, admirable first go at showing lots of different people at different levels on the spectrum because, you know, if you watch some of the Hollywood shows, you know, The Good Doctor, some of them are quite silly but um, but this was different it showed the spectrum it showed lots of different people at different stages and it showed autistic people speaking for themselves having their own relationships talking about their own desires um, the parents and the families and the supporters in the background played this bit part of just people who loved them and were cheering them on it wasn't about us as families it was about them as individuals and Australia got to see that and and, and I think that was the success of it you know absolutely all right let's take our next question it comes from Chelsea Ford Thanks, Hamish. 
Um, my sister has a rare genetic syndrome and intellectual disability, and the NDIS has changed her life. Um, as they stand, as her sister, I'm concerned about the introduction of independent assessments. Mm. I don't believe an allied health professional who doesn't know her or her disability can possibly decide how much support she should get in just an hour or two assessment. I'm also concerned, um, on the other hand, about the sustainability and longevity of the NDIS, um, and I understand that potentially costs may need to be cut somewhere. Um, how can we ensure people like my sister are protected, both short-term and long-term? Nicole, independent assessments, what are we talking about here? Not everyone will know this in the way that folks like you do. OK, great question, thank you. And what a great sister you are. Um, I guess in short, to explain it, is that typically people have entered the NDIS and the first thing to say about the NDIS is it's great. It's life-changing in your family. It's life-changing in hundreds of thousands of other Australians. It's really important. It was agreed to and it was introduced in the bipartisan nature and Australians in huge numbers support it. So I, I don't want to go any further about the NDIS because I am known to give it a bit of a punch occasionally. Um, in saying that it's here, um, we love it. It's changing lives. It's giving dignity and agency to people with disability. It's giving lives to their families. It's important and it's here to stay. That doesn't mean that we can't comment on it, make it better better continuous improvement. And at the moment, the current executive of the NDIS is suggesting that we do away with the kind of clinical inputs that we've previously had uh, to assess a person with a disability's needs, and we replace that with an independent assessment. And that independent assessment would be done by somebody who may or may not have any clinical knowledge of that particular disability, um, that they will come in for an hour or two. They will have an... They don't know you, they're a stranger, they'll come into your home, they'll do this assessment. And the idea... I think, really, I mean, I think the government have been caught out with the fact that this was probably just a cost-saving measure. It's not just the NDIS executive, it's also the government. The government have approved this, yes. The, yeah. the Prime Minister, Stuart Roberts, was all for this, yes, absolutely. So I think the question has to be, this rollout has absolutely failed. It's, it's absolutely fair to say that people, individuals with disabilities in Australia and their families have spent the better part of the last 12 months being pretty petrified about what their life looks like very soon. And we've had one minister shuffle off to Buffalo, but right now the responsibility where I sit sits with Martin Hoffman, the CEO of the NDIS. He has come in arrogantly wanting to roll out this program, not only failed to do so, but has freaked the entire sector out, has united the sector in their opposition to it. Mm. However, he seems to still have a six-figure job and Christine mm. Holgate bought four watches. There's a, there's a double standard here. I'm sorry, I'm missing it, but th the government have got it wrong. There's a new minister. We're hoping she'll listen. But right now, we're really unsure. Andrew Lee. And then, and, and Hamish, uh, Chelsea, Chelsea's story is one that uh, we hear all too often. Uh, there's a story of a nine-year-old girl in a wheelchair who was told through her independent assessment that she didn't have mobility problems. And the idea that a stranger can come in and look at somebody for a couple of hours and make an assessment that then changes your life is, is so wrong-headed. You know, when Bill Shorten helped set up the NDIS, the idea is we should be proud of it as a nation, that it was ex an expression yep. of our generalised love for the whole community. But I've worried too much that under the coalition they see success as being cutting the NDIS, taking money out of it. They took $4 billion out of it at the last election. And these independent assessments uh, aren't the right way to go ahead. Uh, we need to make sure that we've got uh, more, ND, uh, more NDIA workers who understand uh, the sector. Uh, the staffing cap at the moment is hurting. Uh, I agree entirely that management is a, is a real problem right now and perhaps management should be replaced. Uh, but, you know, you look at the way in which the government is cu cutting costs in the NDIS assessment and you compare it to the way in which they splash JobKeeper money around on billionaire shareholders and millionaire CEOs. Uh, you know, you just look at Jerry Harvey, Solomon Liu, Brett Blundy, some of those billionaires who took back millions in JobKeeper at the same time as the government is looking at cutting back support packages. You know, they seem to be toughest on those who are doing it toughest but Andrew... and unwilling to see success in Australia as being a strong NDIS uh, that does provide the, uh, the, the supports for people who need them most. I'm going to... Uh, Andrew, well, look, I... 
I agree. Hang on a second, Hull. I just I want to say, Andrew, though, that I think it is important to go back to your question. Was really really sensible. There's a lot of us that are not sympathetic to the needs of the NDIS being sustainable. I would argue we are the most invested people in whether mm -hmm. or not this scheme is sustainable because it's here for our children and ourselves for the rest of our lives. I care about it more than any minister that's going to come into this job for two seconds. And Stuart mm -hmm. Roberts is gone, and he's got another job, and he's got a promotion. But guess what? We're all still here, and they're our families, and they're our kids, and we're serious about it. So we are. We can have conversations that are economic. We can have them that are mm. pretty sensible about what these policies look like. Don't write us off as families who are just whingers who don't understand it and want more and more. It can't be a blank cheque, but we can be smart enough to make good policy that also takes care of the dignity and rights of individuals with disability. Bill Bosell. Nick, Nick, you are well, just spot on. Like Nicole, uh, you are just spot on. We need to have sensible economic discussions around this. When it comes to independent assessments, I've had quite a bit to say to them. And I just want to say to all the families out there that have experienced them, heard about them, read about them, I am in your corner. They were absolutely appalling throughout the, the, throughout the trial period. And that's been acknowledged by Minister Reynolds. She has only been in this role for a couple of months. Disability is an incredibly complex sector and she's trying to get her head around it. The rollout of the independent assessments just seemed to be the agency trying to put a solution out there before they'd even articulated there was an issue. The idea of 400 personas, whoever came up with that little gem should become a persona non grata. I mean, yeah, absolutely but, not. And but Holly, actually, Linda is not here. Linda is not here tonight. I'm sorry, but the Australian government, the Australian population, if you don't have disability in your life, you probably don't spend a lot of time talking about it, right? We live with it. It's really important to us. The fact that Q&A want to have a conversation tonight where we get to come on and talk about the thing we care about most, the NDIS, we're really grateful for it. I would have liked to have seen the minister in charge of it sitting next to me having this discussion. To, to be fair, we did invite Linda oh, Reynolds on. We also You're here. Good on your hole. Bloody holes turned up. That's we also hell. invited Anne Ruston, who's the social services. Why aren't they here having this conversation? You need to ask them for an explanation. I'm asking, ladies. We're here. <laughs> We're having the conversation. Holly has been brave enough to turn up and speak the truth about what she understands about the NDIS, which is really going to make her probably pretty a bit unpopular with her government tomorrow. I think it's OK for us to have the conversation we can nut this out. We all want it to be successful. We can get there. Holly Hughes, why is the government being so hard-headed about this? It seems pretty clear that the independent assessments have not worked so far, will not work, are not popular, are not wanted. No, I... and Linda has said they are not going ahead in their current format. She has absolutely said they are not going ahead in the current format. That's been recognised. She has said and they're part of the future it. of the NDI. She said they are part no, no, no. of the future. She's talking about functional assessments. And I think what we need to do here, we need to, to sort of divide it into the two conversations. Independent assessments, functional assessments, whatever you want to call them, we need to ensure that people are getting the supports they need that match their goals. At the moment, we go in and have conversations about people's deficits. And the reason I think we're seeing a decline in people's functionality in the NDIS is because we know if you go into your planning meeting and say, hey, we had a great year, they take money away from you. We need to start the conversation being in a completely different frame, saying my goal for the year is to go back into the workplace, is to go and study, is to participate in community activities and work out around the supports around them. Not have a look at can you make a cup of tea or peel a piece of fruit and vegetable because that has nothing to do, let alone the questions that were being asked whether you needed assistance with regards to sexual activity. They're gone. But we can all stand here and scream, and Nick, you, you know, I know you, you understand this. We can all scream from the sideline, we can play politics, we can hit each other over the head with it. The reality is Linda is committed to coming, bringing people back to the table. She inherited this. She didn't design it. We need to be able to go back to the table and say, this didn't work. But the other part of it, Nicole, you're 100% correct, there's no one more focused on sustainability of this scheme than participants and their families. What we're not talking about, where are the service providers and the reviews we're looking at them? We've got three tiers of management when you're a participant. You can be plan managed, agency managed, or there's this uh, self-managed or agency managed, or there's this weird little plan management thing in the middle. I didn't even know this till recently, but Ho if Holly, you know, I, I do wanna, gets a plan... I do want to bring our other panellists in on this. Bill Botel, your view. <laughs> Look, uh, my experience of Medicare, HIV and AIDS and now COVID, the heart and soul of this country is the public health system. 
that incorporates and reflects the values of Australians. And the heart and soul and core of that is the relationship between the uh, patient or the, uh, the client and the clinician, right? The clinician understands the, 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 the patient takes the time and effort and energy to get a view of the whole person. That person cannot be replaced by an algorithm or 400 algorithms or somebody with a clipboard coming in for an hour and trying to fit that patient into some predetermined cost-saving category. So anything that takes away from that, that core relationship with the clinician is something that ought to be rejected. Jaden, I know you're not yourself an NDIS participant, but you work in your, in your job with a lot of people who are. What's your view of independent assessors? Are they well placed to make these decisions about people's lives? Mm -hmm. All right, so <clears throat> in relation to autism, a person see reading and studying and, and I suppose being a professional about autism is quite different to wit in autism, to being in a state where you are seeing it. So one of my, one of my duties is to go and, and work with people who are on the spectrum and who are also recipients of the NDIS. And a parameter of that duty is to develop trust with them, to develop trust between them and the other providers of support that work for the same company as as myself, so the psychologist we work for, who works for us rather, and and everyone else, so that they can all come in and work with them. And that development of trust requires a period of of time. It can take months before certain intricacies of what this diagnosis is can be revealed. What this diagnosis is in relation specifically to this individual. So the information that that is needed to make an informed decision about what this person needs in relation to their funding is not going to be divulged in a simple session with an assessor that lasts for a duration of a, a couple of hours. It is not possible. 100%, and I think Jaden's just also highlighted another piece, is that Jaden is somebody with autism who now works in the sector. This is a $25 billion a year industry. It has a lot of jobs. We are investing in people with a disability, but we're also investing in the community that supports them and works to help that happen. So I want to bring in Monique Blakemore, who's in the audience tonight. There's been a fair bit of discussion about Linda Reynolds, the new minister. You had the opportunity to meet with her recently. What did you tell her about your own situation? Well, I, I spoke to Linda. I was part of um, a Disability Peak meeting with um, Minister Reynolds. And I, at the very beginning, she didn't, um, she wasn't familiar with the phrase, nothing about us without us, which is really the cornerstone of mm. disability rights internationally. Mm. So it became very clear that she really needed to hear a more personal perspective and so I spoke very openly about what it's like to be have more an internal presentation of autism you know a, a level one they like to refer to it as and what that's like to not have support in the community and to be excluded from the NDIS and did she know that you were excluded she didn't. <laughs> she had to, she found that out in the meeting. So there's a big learning curve for her and we really need, we need two things to happen, to be honest. We need that, um, we really need the NDIS to start having meaningful engagement with the disability sector, go one step further. They need to have meaningful engagement with the autism autism communities, plural, and specifically autistic people who sometimes what they want for themselves is not necessarily what others might feel that, that's needed. Um, but we also need to have a national autism strategy like countries like the UK and Malta and learn from their experience because where there is an autism strategy in place, you know, autistic people's well-being increases. But, you know, back to that, that in, ex, internal presentation of autism, you know, while the NDIA excludes us from the NDIS, you know, having a diagnosis means that you are disabled, you know, and it's not a dirty word, being disabled. Um, but, 
you don't have access to a pot of money to quickly access when you're in times of crisis, but yet level one autistic woman like myself would have a life expectancy decades below, um, I think it's like 56 or 58, decades below other people, and yet we're excluded from support. <laughs> Monique, thank you very much for your contribution um, yeah. tonight. Hamish, can I just uh, respond to, to the next? Uh, briefly, if you could, Andrew Lee. One of the things I'm concerned about about the NDIS is that it's turning into a bit of a two-class system where people of means hire lawyers, challenge decisions, and now get a thousand cases in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. And people who can't afford that end up missing out. Uh, and at the same time, carers are too invisible, disability support agencies don't get the backing they need, uh, and we don't have the broader conversations, strengths-based conversations, around accessible buildings uh, and around improving employment for people with disabilities. Uh, there's so many skills that people with autism have uh, around attention to detail, around honesty, uh, and to celebrate that and raise our productivity, as well as making us a more inclusive nation, I think needs to be the goal. Okay. Fix the NDIS and then go further. Let's take our next question tonight. It comes from Angel Huang. Forgiveness. <clears throat> Forgiveness and second chances are fine, but Barnaby Joyce's position is one of great power, privilege and pay. Do you think our country is actually committed to supporting females and progress when Barnaby Joyce is allowed back into office given his alleged past behaviour? Nicole. Um, OK. Barnaby 2.0, will it be better than Barnaby 1.0? Mm, I don't know if you bet the house on that one, but um, I've actually not got a comment on Barnaby. What I'm going to say, and, and again, exceptions to Andrew and Holly, because they're such nice people, um, but is this the best we can do in who we're sending to Canberra? I don't know, that's what worries me when you look at the crop of, was this our choice? Did we have to go back to Barnaby? You look at and sort of say, are our options so low? What have happened to our best and brightest going to Canberra, our smartest Australians, the ones that wanted to lead not as a job description but as like a verb, you know, actually leading? Where are those people and why aren't they being attracted to politics? And, and that's what I think has to come out of this is not why Barnaby but why so few choices? Uh, Holly Hughes, this was... A question about Barnaby Joyce and whether it shows our country is genuinely committed to supporting females. Uh, do you think he deserved a second chance as Deputy Prime Minister? Hi, Mish. Thank you for the question and I uh, appreciate the questioner asking it. I am not going to comment on the National Party and their leadership choice. Well, it's horror, it's, it's not just the National Party, way. it's the government of which you're a member. He's now the Deputy Prime Minister. Your reaction to that? Well, he's the, he's the leader of the National Party and the National Party room made that decision. Now, I'm not going to make any commentary on the decision they made because, quite frankly, I wouldn't want them to make any commentary on the decision the Liberal Party made. So we respect that across all parties. Uh, Andrew would understand that as well. It's a matter for each party room. If the National Party feel that Barnaby is the best person for them leading the National Party, that's their decision. And, you know... It's quite Barnaby telling, isn't it, that that's, that's all you can say the about the new Deputy Prime party. Minister? I, Hamish, look, I, I, I think know you're... Barnaby well. I could say lots more about Barnaby. He certainly injects lots of energy uh, into everything he does. He's a fantastic retail politician. He was elected to, to New England with increased majorities consistently. I mean, he wins so hands down on primary vote. And I understand what Nicole's saying about is this the choice? Well, the people of New England have made that choice consistently and with a very strong voice. The National Party have made their choice when it comes to leader. Uh, and that's a matter for them. Andrew Lee. Hamish, I, I, I think Holly is, is de dead right on this. She wasn't in that party room that chose Barnaby Joyce. Uh, she's in the unfortunate position of having to deal with these 1950s views on, uh, on childcare, and I understand she spoke out vocally on that. Uh, but the fact yeah, is I had that a little this man is a one-man wrecking ball. Uh, you know, it's not just that he wanted to execute Pistol and Boo and confused his trillions <laughs> and billions. Uh, it's not just that he wants nuclear power stations in every town uh, and, uh, and, and thinks that uh, climate change is a hoax. Uh, the fact is that he was removed from the job over sexual harassment allegations and in a Me Too era, he's just not an appropriate person to be the Deputy Prime Minister of the country. Uh, we need uh, people with judgement at a time of crisis. Uh, His last challenge was in the bushfires. This challenge is in a, in a pandemic. We need people who think about the nation not just thinking about themselves.
Jaden, I know you have done Toastmasters yourself. You're a fan of, of respectful discourse in public life. What do you make of our politics and the way it's conducted? <laughs> <laughs> Jaden for Canberra. Uh, no, yeah. absolutely not. <laughs> no. no. Um, so, I, I suppose it is not something that I have ever sustained much interest in, and that is because I do not always feel that my demeanour towards civility and and respect between different different groups and and idea groups specifically that my demeanour for that is always represented by the people who who are our representatives and Barnaby Joyce he knows how to earn a lot of attention and he <laughs> must be a very charming man <laughs> but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I am curious about the question of whether, whether the ability or inability for one to lead in their own personal life is reflective of their ability or inability to lead in their professional life. Does that mm. cause them to be a, a vessel of the morality that we require in the administration of a nation? And what do you think? On that question, Jade. I, I certainly would like. I I am yet a little undecided on, on my answer to that. But certainly, I have hitherto maintained not too much interest in, in Barnaby Joyce, and I think going <laughs> forth, I will continue to man maintain no interest in him. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a very good question. Well, wins answer of the year on Q&A <laughs> so far. Uh, Bill Botel, are you interested in Barnaby Joyce? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm more interested really uh, in what Barnaby Joyce represents uh, in relation to climate change. Uh, since 2007, we've had five Prime Ministers, five, pri five governments. Each one of them, more or less, has been brought down because of an inability to come to terms with the facts and evidence of climate change. Each Prime Minister has gone in, what, 14 years. Uh, Barnaby Joyce coming back in represents a return to strong climate denialism, a rejection of the facts and evidence about climate change, and creates a diabolical problem for the internal unity of the present federal government. And you have to say that if this is unresolved, and no serious uh, proposition can be taken to the meeting that's coming up in Glasgow about reduction of emissions, much less anything else we have to do, then we might well be in, in train of seeing the sixth uh, Prime Minister fall in less than 15 years on climate change. We cannot go on like this. It's bad for the economy. It's certainly bad for the health of Australians and the planet. And it is time to change. And uh, Barnaby Joyce coming back in is just a symptom of a real inability to come to terms with the facts and evidence. OK. We've got time for one last question tonight. It comes from William McCarthy. During the Prime Minister's visit to the UK, he visited three pubs. When Australians are stuck overseas and families haven't seen each other for nearly a year and a half, the Prime Minister is making visits for his own enjoyment. Does the Prime Minister think that he's more entitled than other Australians to visit family overseas? Or is it just that he has better things to do than increase vaccination rates and contain the latest COVID clusters? Andrew Lee. Uh, William, being a Prime Minister is a hard job, but I think ultimately you need to recognise that you're making decisions not in your self-interest or the interest of your family, uh, but in the national interest. And in taking a holiday to Hawaii during the bushfires or choosing to go to a couple of pubs and uh, follow up on his family genealogy, Scott Morrison forgot that he was there for Australians, and he failed to make the sacrifices that we expect of a true leader. I just can't imagine a John Curtin or a Gough Whitlam having made such a serious error of judgment. And it does go to Scott Morrison's ability to transcend the job and to be a leader of whom we can all be proud. When Australians are stuck overseas, where Australians are unable to go overseas to be at the bedside of a dying parent. The idea that the Prime Minister would take a sojourn in a pub or check out a, a long-past long ancestor uh, just seemed deeply wrong to me. 
and out of touch. Uh, Holly Hughes? Look, I, I understand what Andrew's saying, but I really think we're missing the point of what the G7 was about when we're worried about stopping for a feed at a pub or half an hour at a grave site. At the end of the day, the Prime Minister is more than aware, as is everybody else in this country, of the limitations that COVID's producing. But the Prime Minister went to the UK to represent us when it comes to national security. He, came, he went to the UK to represent us when you look at the economy and trade. The UK free trade deal was put together while he was over there. And quite honestly, I think if everyone's hung up on a trip to a pub and calling into a, a, a cemetery where a, lot, you know, a, a fifth generation grandfather or something was buried on the way back to the airport, um, if that's what you took out of the G7, I really think you missed the point. You probably need to engage in some of the issues that are happening globally when you look at the Indo-Pacific, when you look at what China's doing in the South China Sea, what's happening to trade across the world. I'm pretty sure our barley producers and our winemakers were more interested in being able to get their product into the UK than whether he stopped for a feed in Cornwall. All right, we'll leave it there on that note. That's all we've got time for tonight. Would you please thank our wonderful panel, Nicole Rogerson, Bill Botel, Jaden Evans, Andrew Lee, and Holly Hughes. And Jaden, go easy on the DMs in your social media, mate. It sounds dangerous. Oh, Next no. week, we're live in Queensland at the Brisbane Powerhouse. The Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk will be on the panel. Border restrictions mean that I may or may not be there, so please join whoever is hosting the show next week. Have a very good night.